What do we really know about our past? About our past. Are we suffering from a collective memory loss? Collective memory loss. Was there a technically advanced unified civilization on Earth less than 500 years ago? What role did the world's fairs play in introducing forgotten technology? Why did human knowledge suddenly explode in the 19th century? Did someone secretly destroy remnants of old world structures under the pretense of a temporary exposition? Nothing is as it seems. It's time for us to remember again and lift the veil of deception. Collective memory. And now the mythless man, eternally hungry, stands among all pasts, digging and burrowing for roots, be it that he had to dig for them even in the remotest antiquities. To what does the tremendous historical need of the unsatisfied modern culture, the gathering around of countless other cultures, the consuming desire for recognition point, if not to the loss of the myth, to the loss of the mythical home, the mythical womb. Without myth, however, every culture loses its healthy creative power. Friedrich Nietzsche, the birth of tragedy from the spirit of music. The most pressing problem of man today is the loss of meaning. Meaning is rooted in the past. When knowledge of the past fades, so does the meaning of life. Today's man does not know where he comes from, who he is, and where he is going. He has become a pawn in the hands of powers that can direct him at will. Uprooted from his past, there is no foundation. And without a foundation based on reality, there is no way to develop an objective understanding of the world. Only the way back to one's roots gives meaning back to life. Epigenetics, the study of heritable changes in gene expression that are not directly encoded in our DNA, suggests that our life experiences, such as hardships, traumatic experiences, etc., are passed on to subsequent generations. Mythological and religious traditions go even further and speak of a collective memory. Already in the Vedas, the holy scriptures of Hinduism, a kind of universal memory is mentioned. The Sanskrit word akasha stands for heaven, space, or ether and, according to the Eastern wisdom tradition, refers to the most subtle of the five elements from which everything else was created. Thus, according to Indian mythology, all thoughts that have ever been thought and all deeds that have ever been performed are stored in this information field, which is also expressed in the legendary palm leaf libraries of India and Sri Lanka. The conception of a world memory also exists in the Occidental culture. We can find similar references in the Bible, for example, when the book of Isaiah speaks of a memory book. Every activity is a form of energy, and energy cannot be dissipated. It is retained. We are in a closed system. See, everything you do, everything you say, every action you take, every penny you earn or spend is recorded. 
so we can assume that all experiences of our ancestors still exist in an energy field invisible to us. Until around 100 years ago, the ether was still a standard concept in physics to explain the properties of invisible space. And even if today we are largely disconnected from our past, the experiences have not disappeared, but are only buried. Accordingly, it must be possible for us to reconnect with our past if we lift the veil and allow the memories to surface again. In order to access collective memories, a collective effort is required, to a certain degree. An individual alone is not able to break through the amnesia. There are images that are so strongly charged with meaning that people are inexplicably drawn to them. The world's religions draw to some extent on such images, albeit in extremely destructive ways. Myths and fairy tales also contain such images. The more a myth is charged with meaning, the more important was its role in our past. By the radiance of a myth, we can already recognize its importance for mankind, if we allow it and let ourselves be touched by it. For example, the flood has burned itself into our collective memory, but so have the stories of giants, dragons, or malicious witches. The more we humans abandon these mythical images, the more we alienate ourselves from our own past and thus from our own being. This process of self-alienation began with the so-called Age of Enlightenment. Emmanuel Velikovsky writes, Amnesia is one of the defense reactions of man. We know the effects of battle shock on soldiers. In the older Greek authors, the Pythagoreans and the Stoics, you find definite statements indicating that catastrophes which occurred in the history of the human race and in the history of our Earth were not abnormal events. They were actually dominant, repeating themselves again and again. But from the historical records, we see that the knowledge of the catastrophes disappeared slowly into oblivion. Plato described cataclysms in several works. He wrote about worlds destroyed and rebuilt. In his Timaeus, he noted that the Greeks do not remember ancient catastrophes besides the deluge. He adds that the people of his time, as the priests of Sais told Solon, were unable to remember these catastrophic events. In another work, whose authorship is probably wrongly ascribed to Plato, he is presented as believing in a peaceful universe. Plato's pupil Aristotle refused to believe in catastrophes. The scholarly world has accepted Aristotle's view that the planets can never change their motions. He, more than anyone else, is responsible for the continuing belief that we live in a safe world, on a planet to which nothing like collisions can happen. Aristotle argued that those who believe in celestial catastrophes should be brought to trial and, if convicted, punished by death. Because of man's aversion to knowing his past, science has been greatly retarded, pretending unreality to be as truth. The Darwinian revolution was also a regression. Disturbing evidence was ignored. It was as if he worked with closed eyes. Darwin proposed that only the fittest survive. His notebooks from the only field trip he ever undertook contained descriptions of cataclysmic disruptions. He wrote that nothing less than the shaking of the entire frame of the earth could result in the mass annihilation of life forms that he observed. Darwin did not accept the implications of the evidence that he saw with his his own eyes. The Darwinian revolution was the rebirth of Aristotle, whose ideas had lost ground, if not at the time of the Renaissance, then in the Age of Enlightenment. Even in the Age of Enlightenment, men espoused ideas of a peaceful earth. In recent centuries, great efforts have been made to make us humans forget where we come from and who we are. The destruction of the old knowledge of physics and biology was particularly powerful in uprooting us. Einstein and Darwin represent the inversion of the old knowledge into a nihilistic worldview, with man as a meaningless, random something, adrift in an endless and cold universe. These anti-life models about reality were perfected only recently, in the 19th century, and could even fully prevail only in the 20th century. 
Too great was the resistance even in academic circles of the 20th century. The so-called Big Bang Theory is a good example to understand how religious esoteric concepts entered science. The Belgian Jesuit and priest Georges Lemaitre created the Big Bang Theory, not on the basis of scientific facts, but on the basis of a religious conviction, a notion of a primordial or cosmic seed from which everything evolved. At that time, the Jesuits were given the task of embedding the myths of the origin of the world in a scientific-sounding framework. A few decades later, in 1951, the Pontifical Academy of Sciences accepted the Big Bang Theory. This long wait for the Pope's acceptance was not due to opposition from the Church, but from the general public. After all, the Big Bang Theory originated in the hands of the Vatican itself. Ironically, the irrational Big Bang Theory is still part of our modern worldview, and still not a single proof has been presented. The nihilistic and mechanistic worldview represented by Rousseau and other so-called masterminds of the Enlightenment could only flourish on the breeding ground of industrialization. After all, industrialization turned man into a mechanical being who was reduced to material aspects. Industrialization must be seen as a turning point and as the most notable event that is still comprehensible and visible to us today as a result of a reset in the 18th or early 19th century. This reset followed an event that also brought about the so-called mud flood. All over the world, the buildings of the old world were partially submerged in the earth, and the former first floors were thus usually converted into cellars. Little is known about the cause of the mud flood, possibly a world war we don't remember or an electromagnetic plasma event. Velikovsky again on this. C.G. Jung became rather convinced that the unconscious mind whether by telepathy or in some other way, is a common possession of the entire human race. But it is not only constituted of the experiences of this generation, we who interact in this world today, it includes the cumulative experiences of all generations past. This is more than just telepathy, but something which is brought down from generation to generation. The fact is that catastrophic events have taken place, not just in a cave here or in a cave there, but events of indescribable violence, such that no human being who succeeded to survive could be free from the traumatic effects. Traumatic effects, as I say, indescribable. Imagine, suddenly, time is no more time. The day does not move into the night. The ocean does not just beat at the coast of the Atlantic. It moves over the continent. Not even moves over the continent. Continent and sea just change places. Where were plains, mountains are thrust up in a matter of hours. The air is filled with loud hissing noises of meteorites falling down and all volcanoes erupting simultaneously. Not just the volcanoes that existed, but thousands of new volcanoes coming up and blazing, and rivers losing their beds, and earthquakes removing cities from their foundations. The human history that starts with the invention of writing is hardly 5,000 years old. Any one of you who reached already the age of 25 lived a full half percent of the recorded history. Before I finish, I will read you a letter from one of my readers. I feel that the ancients in myth, epic, and sacred works have been trying to tell us something about a problem that bothered them a great deal, 
It appears fairly clear that our ancestors were trying to communicate a deep fear, a terrible anxiety. They were talking about a problem that was so terrible that the most drastic measures to group discipline and or self-repression were justified. It was a powerful fear. It is sometimes suggested that the Bible can directly be applied to modern life and that all the ancients were really writing about were the problems of survival while avoiding neurosis, worries, unhappiness, and so on. To me, that approach is very unconvincing. The God those people were writing about was terrifying. In the Old Testament, he is the God of wrath. And in the New Testament, as Albert Schweitzer, among others, has pointed out, he is about to end the world in Jesus' lifetime or shortly thereafter. He was dangerous and violent. Rock, fire, flood, hurricane, and similar weapons he used on those he judged ill of. That's what the ancients wrote, and I see no point in trying to water it down. That's what they meant. They were really scared. Emanuel Velikovsky. Morphic resonance is a connection across time from the past to the present. And it's a process that occurs between organized patterns of activity on the basis of similarity. What it means, in effect, is that each species has a kind of collective memory. According to biologist Rupert Sheldrake, collective memory is inherent to nature. Living systems have a collective memory of all past experiences of the entire species. This memory exists in an invisible but real energy field. Our collective memories are still there, but since the dawn of modernity they mainly break through in supposedly fictional stories, e.g. in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings universe. Tolkien wrote down his story, rooted in Germanic mythology, during the First World War at exactly the time that can be recognized as the final destruction of the old magical world. World War I marked the beginning of the civilizational descent into soulless modernity. Perhaps Tolkien had to write down his vision of Middle-earth because the human psyche cannot survive without a connection to reality, even if this connection is maintained via supposedly fictional stories. It is interesting to note in this context that fantasy stories are also an invention of the industrial age. It was only around 1850 that fictional novels became suitable for mass consumption. Could it be that people were not interested in immersing themselves in dissociative worlds as long as life itself was full of meaning and conveyed a higher purpose? The more hostile and cold our society becomes, the stronger becomes the urge to escape into imaginary worlds. And as these imaginary worlds are fed by our collective memories, it is this repressed energy which breathes life into them. With the destruction of religions by so-called science founded by secret societies, people were deprived of one of the last connections to the past. But the truth wants to come to light again, and it will eventually resurface. Enormous efforts are being made to keep humanity asleep, because our potential and true power is almost limitless. Industrialization During the course of industrialization during the 19th century, far-reaching social changes occurred in the Western world. The extent of these changes has not yet been adequately understood. Aspects such as rural flight, mass impoverishment, orphanages, lack of hygiene in the cities and related epidemics are known in historical research. But these are only the effects of the Industrial Revolution. A more elusive topic has been the question, what caused the massive technological upheavals of the 19th century? So far, the two most important questions have not been answered sufficiently. Why did the Industrial Revolution begin in England, and why precisely around 1800? 
If you break it down to its essence, the Industrial Revolution consisted of groundbreaking technological inventions that permanently changed social life and enabled increasing automation of production. In particular, the development of the steam engine supposedly laid the foundation for the further development of electric and internal combustion engines which form the foundation of today's society. The Industrial Revolution presents us with a conundrum. In terms of the official narrative, humanity bumbled along at a low state of development for thousands of years, only to suddenly undergo a massive leap in development within a few decades without any apparent external cause. To make matters even more absurd, since the end of the Industrial Age, mankind has again found itself in a period of technological stagnation. The supposed inventive spirit of Central Europe and Germany in particular, which historians say made industrialization possible, seems to have vanished. The role of the United Kingdom is central to understanding what was really behind the so-called Industrial Revolution. In historical research, it is commonly believed that the Industrial Revolution began as early as the mid-18th century, around 1760. In fact, however, little evidence can be found to support this claim. According to various historians, Cameron, Adams, McCloskey, there is no evidence of industrialization in contemporary literature as late as 1830. We must assume that the ruling forces backdated the course of the Industrial Revolution in order to somewhat diffuse its explosive character. In fact, the new technological knowledge was unleashed on humanity within a few decades by a small elite operating primarily from Rome, Vatican, Venice, London, and Washington. The true Industrial Revolution comes closest to what is commonly referred to in research as the Second Industrial Revolution, the phase of rapid industrialization beginning in 1860. What is being sold to us as inventions was, in all likelihood, a controlled release of technologies that were widely available and powered by free energy before the reset. Free in the sense that everyone had direct access to the energy source. Only this time, the difference was that the technology was tied to scarce and hard-to-get resources, allowing the ruling powers to gain a monopoly on the production of goods. Since the Industrial Revolution, the worldwide generation and production of wealth has been controlled by a small group. Along with the control of the fiat money system through central banks, the scarcity of energy has been the most important element in controlling the masses. This process is reflected, for example, in the conflict between Tesla and Edison, or Tesla and Einstein. Tesla defended the holistic model of the world, thinking in terms of energy, frequencies, and vibration, and did not want energy production to end up in the hands of a few. When the industrialists, first of all J.P. Morgan, who at that time were responsible for building the energy monopolies, realized that Tesla's work was not suitable for the oppression of humanity, he was marginalized into oblivion. If, in reality, the Industrial Revolution did not take place until well after 1830, we are talking about a period of 50 years, roughly 1850 to 1900, during which the old knowledge was reintroduced in modified form. Not coincidentally, the first major World's Fair was held in London in 1851. Imperialism. 
Why did the Industrial Revolution begin in England? Historians are in the dark. But the single deciding factor that set the British Empire apart from all other countries at the time was colonialism and imperialism. The British crown controlled a large part of the so-called New World, and the crown, of course, stole not only labor and goods, as historians like to portray, but the remaining knowledge from before the reset as well. And knowledge includes technologies. Officially, much of India's knowledge is said to have been wiped out by a genocide of Indian scholars and a series of invasions over the course of the last 1,200 years, but evidence suggests that it was British colonialism that significantly mutilated India's culture. For example, one of the main activities of the Asiatic Society of Bengal, officially founded in 1784 and under the patronage of Warren Hastings, was to systematically collect and preserve ancient manuscripts of India, as well as inscriptions in stone and metal, icons, or ancient coins. And Friedrich Max Muller, one of the founders of the Western academic field of Indian studies, was paid by the East India Trading Company to translate the Vedas, to distort them permanently, and to create arbitrary dates. Thus, on December 9, 1867, he wrote to his wife, I feel convinced, though I shall not live to see it, that this edition of mine and the translation of the Veda will hereafter tell to a great extent on the fate of India and on the growth of millions of souls in that country. It is the root of their religion, and to show them what that root is, I feel sure the only way of uprooting all that has sprung from it during the last 3,000 years. Friedrich Max Müller in a book titled The Truth About Us, The Politics of Information and Society from Manu to Modi, Sanjoy Chakravorty shows that even the current understanding of the caste system was developed only during British colonial rule, at a time when the colonial power's power over information was absolute. Anthropologist Susan Bailey noted that, Well into the colonial period... Much of the subcontinent was populated by people for whom the formal distinctions of caste were of limited importance, even in parts of the so-called Hindu heartland. The institutions and beliefs that are often described today as elements of the traditional caste system did not emerge until the early 18th century. Susan Bailey even the pre-colonial written records in royal court documents and travelogues studied by professional historians and philologists such as Nicholas Dirks, G.S. Guri, Richard Eaton, David Shulman, and Cynthia Talbot make little or no mention of the caste system. But back to the United Kingdom, for India has been called the jewel in the crown for good reason. Michelle Gibson writes, European colonialism intentionally created divides over almost the entire land mass of the earth, creating new countries from land that were taken, as well as divisions and discords between people that originally existed in harmony worldwide. It also diagrams the means by which power and control were consolidated worldwide, mostly starting out as trading companies that ended up being very powerful in their respective regions. And after gaining complete control, transferring power and control of the regions to their respective European empires, India was called the jewel in the crown of the British Empire and its largest and most important overseas possession. Much of the British Empire was built around India in order to provide routes to or protection for India. India was prosperous and rich in spices, silk, indigo, gold, cotton, and other products and resources. Trade with and eventual political dominance of large parts of India was what provided Britain with large parts of its wealth in the 1700s through 1900s. We can imagine that before the reset, the European countries had embassies in India and there was a lively cultural exchange of values and goods which collapsed only in the wake of the cataclysmic events. 
A new European elite took advantage of the power vacuum created by the collapse of the advanced civilizations and transformed the formerly existing trade structures into all-consuming power apparatuses. This would also explain existing inconsistencies. For historical research has never been able to explain satisfactorily why the colonial powers only began to expand their rule over the colonies with brute force and blind missionary zeal a few hundred years after colonization. This so-called high imperialism began in 1850, with the suppression of the Indian Rebellion of 1857 considered a key event. In 1885, the Congo Conference, held in Berlin at Bismarck's invitation, settled the effective division of Africa among the colonial powers. At the Congo Conference, the concept of state formation was applied to Africa and imposed on the continent. But thinking in terms of state boundaries and national identities was still fairly new in Europe as well. In 1884, the Washington Agreement enforced the worldwide time system according to Greenwich Mean Time, which had been introduced in the British Empire in 1847. The role of the German Empire in relation to imperialism was primarily to denounce human rights violations, to establish legal foundations, and to keep in check the colonial superpowers that were committing inconceivable atrocities in the colonies. However, in the course of falsifying history after World War II, German imperialism is nowadays usually portrayed in a negative light. Based on this lie, the German colonies were divided among the other colonial powers after WW1. To outline the research of colonialism expert Bruce Gilley. German East Africa a German protectorate was a complete success. The Germans brought peace to Africa, the Pax Germanica. They successfully put down the Magi Magi Rebellion from 1905 to 1907, and reforms after 1907 ushered in an era of progress. Workers' rights for natives, an end to forced labor, prohibition of slavery, and compulsory education were German achievements that eclipsed all other colonial powers. The Germans were extremely popular in East Africa. That's why World War I lasted so long in East Africa, because the native fighters were so devoted to the German Empire that they continued to fight until the bitter end in the fall of 1918. Since 1907, there were councils for the interests of the Africans, a decentralized administration, and administrative schools for a local elite. Harry Rudin wrote, The comment often heard about the Germans was that they were strict, sometimes harsh, but always just. An interesting note about the German colonial period in Africa is that it was the German physician Robert Koch who found a cure for sleeping sickness, which was then stolen by the French and used throughout the country starting in the 1920s. Heinrich Schnee, the last German governor of East Africa, coined the term colonial guilt lie in the face of British lies. Bruce Gilley. Most of the official history of colonialism between 1500 and 1800 is probably largely fabricated, which includes the notion that the Spanish were responsible for the impressive South American architecture, 
or that the British rebuilt India from the ground up. This is all a lie. Instead, sometime between 1700 and 1850, a worldwide cataclysm occurred by which the unified culture broke apart and most knowledge about free energy and high culture was lost. People were collectively thrown into a dark age in which they began to focus on survival and experienced a period of suffering and deprivation. The now dominant power elite, upon coming to power, reintroduced some parts of the old knowledge to change society in a way that suited them. This time period is known to us as the Industrial Age. This power elite has its roots in the Roman Empire. The countries of the Western Roman Empire gradually became huge economic and warlike nations. Italy, Venice, Portugal, Spain, France, Britain, the Netherlands. The first financial center was established in Venice, which was later moved to Switzerland. All those who did not want to submit to the church were killed or fled towards Germania. The approach of the church corresponds to the tactics of the Roman conquests. The church then divided the territory and set up its own administrators in these areas. The subsequent emergence of the high nobility, all of them loyal to the church, can be attributed to this. The Roman army was at one point dissolved and divided into knightly orders. Germany, as a stronghold of Protestantism, was able to resist these ecclesiastical forces a little longer, but was also taken over at some point, as was the Moscovite Tartary, the former empire of the Scythians, which was taken over by Russia. Since then, the European powers have all been controlled from behind the scenes by the Cabal, and they managed to make it look like Britain, Germany, France, Portugal, Spain, and Russia were competing with each other. But they were actually working together. The Hohenzollern and Orange Nassau noble families simultaneously controlled Britain, the Netherlands, the German Empire, as well as the Russian Tsarist Empire. The Habsburgs, funded by the Fuggers, controlled Central Europe, the Vatican, and parts of Western Europe. So the Russian Tsarist Empire was already in the hands of the Cabal, moving from Prussia to Russia, and Russian history was written in the 18th century by Western European academics, who also occupied the most important positions in the newly founded Russian Academy of Sciences. The Russian Empire was then deployed to destroy the Great Tartar Empire. The heart of the darkness lay in Western Europe. It was a race against time, for most of the world was just recovering from the reset, and all the Europeans had to do was get a few of their people on ships, get them quickly to the ruined kingdoms, kill or expel or manipulate the rulers, and proclaim a new political system. The Japanese seclusion edict, reportedly from 1636, stated the following. No Japanese ship nor any native of Japan shall presume to go out of the country. Whoever acts contrary to this shall die, and the ship with the crew and goods aboard shall be sequestered until further orders. All persons who return from abroad shall be put to death. Whoever discovers a Christian priest shall have a reward of 400 to 500 sheets of silver and for every Christian in proportion. All Namban, Portuguese and Spanish, who propagate the doctrine of the Catholics or bear this scandalous name shall be imprisoned in the Onra or common jail of the town. The whole race of the Portuguese with their mothers, nurses, and whatever belongs to them shall be banished to Macau. Whoever presumes to bring a letter from abroad or to return after he hath been banished shall die with his family. Also, whoever presumes to intercede for him shall be put to death. No nobleman nor any soldier shall be suffered to purchase anything from the foreigner. Thus began a social epoch in Japan known today as Sakoku. 
the voluntary isolation of Japan from all Western powers. It was not until 1853, two years after the First World's Fair in London, that the West actually succeeded in turning Japan away from its peaceful, self-sufficient life. The policy of the Sakuku ended after 1853, when the American black ships commanded by Matthew Perry forced the opening of Japan to American and thus Western trade through a series of unequal treaties. This was just a few years after the same forces had destroyed ancient China in what is now known as the Opium Wars. In 1842, the Qing Dynasty was forced to sign the Treaty of Nanking, the first of what the Chinese later called the Unequal Treaties, which granted Britain compensation and extraterritoriality, opened five treaty ports to foreign merchants, and ceded Hong Kong Island to the British Empire. The failure of the treaty to fulfill British goals of improved trade and diplomatic relations led to the Second Opium War, 1856 to 1860, and the defeat of the Qing led to social unrest within China. In China, the war is considered the beginning of modern Chinese history. The same old game over and over again. It is important to realize that everyone in China and Japan hated Catholics because Catholicism was used as a weapon to weaken their countries culturally before the British also took over the political structures. Until the 1840s, China and Japan were defending themselves quite successfully. Even back then, Vatican-controlled Catholicism had nothing to do with genuine Christianity. Rather, the Vatican was used to infiltrate genuine Christianity. Michelle Gibson. The year of 1493 was the year that Pope Alexander VI authorized the land grab of the Americas in the Intercetera Papal Bull. This papal bull became a major document in the development of subsequent legal doctrines regarding claims of empire in the New World and assigned to Castile and Spain the exclusive right to acquire territory to trade in or even approach the lands laying west of the meridian situated 100 leagues west of the Azores and Cape Verde Islands, except for any lands actually possessed by any other Christian prince beyond this meridian prior to Christmas 1492. Michelle Gibson. The emperor of the Roman Empire became the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church the famous papal bull Unum Sanctum, supposedly dating back to the Middle Ages, was intended to cement the absolute rule of the Pope. The last sentence of this bull reads, But we now declare, say, and define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation for every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. Thus the Pope legitimized himself as the sole representative of God on earth. The so-called heretical Christian communities, such as the Albigensians and Cathars, condemned the papacy as the Church of the Antichrist and considered themselves the successors of the true Christian heritage, which, however, was allowed to continue only in secret. Papal Catholics were accused, among other things, of being responsible for the mysterious fires that destroyed entire cities. The monument in the city of London about the London Fire of 1666 still read until 1830, The most terrible destruction of this city, begun and carried on by the treachery and wickedness of the papal faction. Western historians confused Jesuit Catholicism with Christianity and accused Japan and China of blindly hating all Christians while omitting all facts proving the obvious interference of the Jesuits and the Catholic Church in foreign affairs. Thus, regarding the reshaping of the Chinese chronology, we read the following from Uva Topper in The Great Forgery Event. Perhaps the most lasting effect of Jesuit work, however, lay in the reshaping of Chinese chronology and its alignment with Western data. 
the creation of a chronological system was quite new for the Chinese. It was done according to the Latin model and on the whole in the spirit of the Catholic Church. The whole process took a century and a half and was finally terminated by the Chinese from 1735 by force. As a result of the immense work, the first complete work of Chinese history appeared in 1778, something that had never been done before in China. There were not only the dynasties, the order of emperors, and their dates of reign, but also the transfer of these dates to the European timescale. Although the errors in it are always criticized, the work has not become obsolete to this day, but has remained in principle the guide for our sinologists, even if they should no longer be aware of it. Uwe Topper. With this rewriting of the chronology, the Jesuits laid the groundwork for the British takeover of China in 1842. Not only Christianity, but also Islam and Judaism were sooner or later used to control the masses. Because of the nature of the rewrite, we do not even know if the general timeline of events prior to these wars in the name of imperialism is true. The timeline for many events around the world was artificially extended to give more credence to the idea of a centuries-long process of colonization and to distract from the fact that, until the reset, there was a unified civilization of multiple independent cultures that traded peacefully with each other. The supposedly new technological knowledge was introduced worldwide in the course of the 19th century, first and foremost in Western Europe and the Americas. An important role in the reintroduction of the old technologies in the new guise of energy scarcity was played by the world's fairs. From 1851 onwards, countless world exhibitions were held. Today, this tradition still exists in the form of the expos, but in principle, they no longer play a role, since there have been no real technological breakthroughs since the two world wars, with the exception of information technology, which is being deliberately developed to bring the dystopian vision of transhumanism to the world. It can be said that with World War I, not only classical architecture, but also innovation disappeared from the world. Before industrialization, there was only one form of sophisticated architecture in the world. Known today as historicism or revival architecture, because according to the official narrative, virtually all of these buildings were created only in the 19th century, supposedly as a recourse to ancient Greco-Roman architectural trends. Neo-Gothic, Neo-Renaissance, Neo-Baroque, etc. The basic principles of these buildings were always the same and their quality unrivaled. Is this uniform architecture an indication of a unified civilization that only recently broke up into individual kingdoms or nation-states? Even in Japan, there were these Greco-Roman classical buildings before 1900, although Japan was still completely isolated from the outside world until around 1850. And even after that, after the British had forcibly conquered Japan, it only slowly and hesitantly opened up to the West. The German chronology critic Christoph Pfister writes in his book The Matrix of Ancient History, about the chronological dating of European building culture. It turned out that today's Occidental building culture, the emergence of today's medieval cities, date back about 300 years before today. Before that, according to today's linguistic usage at the beginning of the 18th century, there was still a culture in Europe that can be called Roman, or rather, Late Roman. In a political sense, too, there seems to have been a late Roman Empire. In this, however, the political center of power shifted from Gaul to Germania. The collapse of the late Roman Empire was a fact. However, it cannot be said what the causes were. Natural disasters, epidemics, political, economic, and cultural factors are mentioned as triggers. The breakup of the old Roman power created the basis for a new, modern culture. 
This was, in a sense, rebuilt on the basis of a tabula rasa. There was a turning point of culture with apparently only few connecting points to the former civilization. The cultural dynamic of Europe was expansive towards the outside. Towards the West, the discovery and colonization of the two Americas and then of Africa and Asia took place. The successful colonization of the New World and East Asia saved Europe and gave it a privileged position as a world colonial power from about the middle of the 18th century. The New Europe, which emerged in the first decades of the 18th century, first invented the written language that has been preserved today, and thus the written culture. Art and architecture, too, were largely created only after the great political and cultural break. Christoph Fitzer. In other words, the colonization of the world did not take place until 1700 at the earliest, but was backdated by the falsifiers of history on behalf of the imperial powers. Imperialism developed as a reaction to an event, possibly a war or a natural disaster, which wiped out the old, so-called ancient, world and left a power vacuum. Western Europe managed to emerge from this vacuum as a winner. Imperialism was kind of a worldwide raid by the Western European powers to grab the countries of the world that had been devastated by the catastrophe. The conflicts between the individual colonial powers, Spain, Portugal, England, Germany, etc., that have been handed down historically are part of the game of hide-and-seek played by the European power elite organized in secret societies and shadow organizations. But these conflicts took place only on a superficial political level because, as is the case today, public decision-makers were rarely privy to the real plans. Let us now look at the story of two buildings. Penn Station in New York, built between 1904 and 1910, demolished in 1963 because the building was dirty and the maintenance costs could allegedly no longer be met. Built in the Greco-Roman style, Ada Louise Huxtable wrote in the New York Times in 1963. The tragedy is that our present age not only could not produce such a building, but could not even maintain it. Ada Huxtable. County Savings Building, built in 1893 in the Neo-Romanesque style. We read about the demolition of the Erie County Savings Bank Building in 1968 in the Buffalo Evening News. Every evening for more than three months, a battle was fought in Shelton Square between her and two cavernous cranes. The latter attacked with two primitive means of offense, a pair of jaws and a rock or in modern wreckers parlance, a clam bucket and a busting ball. The former weighed in at three tons, the latter at three and a half. The fight was one of the toughest in veteran wreckers memory. For a wrecker to admit resistance is like a weightlifter confessing his muscles are getting flabby. It began at 4.30 in the afternoon and continued through 7.30 the next morning, five days a week. A crowd of variable size would gather to see the kill. It was the show of the town. Whole families arrived in station wagons from the suburbs. The original plans of the building were made available when the crane operations of the 25-man demolition crew began to munch at the building, however. It was evident that plans and reality did not agree. The roof with its turrets and gargoyles and finials was the toughest. 
A finial lifted intact like a birthday candle to the ground, measured three and a half feet high and weighed an estimated 600 pounds. Not to mention the cones on the towers, which look like cake frosting aloft, but on the ground measured 20 feet high and 15 feet across, cast iron and steel. As the wrecking progressed, scores of 200 pound red granite carved images, five feet thick, set in the walls around the crest of the building came tumbling down, their carnival faces of joy and sorrow biting the dust. The very stones of the building were resistant. The walls, which tapered from nine feet at the base up to three feet, were composed of foot-thick red granite stones weighing up to three tons each. Interlocked, they had to be lifted out like lumps of sugar, piece by piece. They did not sound like sugar when they dropped. If we look at the bigger picture, the two world wars appear in a new light. The colonization of the world took place later than we are told, only in the 1700s. By the early 1900s, most of the world was under the control of the European elite-controlled colonial powers, primarily England, France, the Netherlands, Spain, Belgium, Portugal, Russia, Italy. These nations were all already infiltrated by secret societies. Then, with the two world wars, European culture itself was largely destroyed, and as a result, people were deprived of the ability to remember. The wars created a collective trauma that made it difficult to connect with the pre-war period. If we look at the earliest photographs from the former colonies, particularly India, we see a world in ruins and people who are not suited to the structures in which they live. These photos resemble 18th and 19th century landscapes of Europe. If we ignore the official timeline for a moment, we can entertain the thought that our world was laid in ruins not too long ago, and that this event allowed parasitic forces to establish a new world order. This new world order is still in the making, and has as its goal the complete uprooting of man from his being and his history. The 19th century saw the conquest of the last part of the Tartar Empire by the Russian Empire. The independent, or free Tartary, as it was called on the old maps, was located until about 1870 directly east of the Caspian Sea in the territory of today's Uzbekistan with cities like Samarkand and Bukhara. However, Tartary is not mentioned in the official history of Uzbekistan. Anatoly Fomenko writes on the subject of independent Tartary. Unlike Moscow Tartary, the fate of independent Tartary is known. It was conquered by the Romanovs in the middle of the 19th century. Samarkand, the capital of the independent Tartary, was seized by the Romanovs army in 1868. A few decades later, the Soviets, on behalf of the Cabal, destroyed large parts of the Central Asian remnants of the Old World in the name of Communism. The First Anglo-Afghan War, the settlement of New Zealand and Australia, and the gold rush in the American West also fall within this period. Consequences of Industrialization in 1839, John D. Rockefeller Sr. was born in the United States. He later founded the Standard Oil Company in 1870. The World's Fairs coincided with the power struggle for authority in physics and the monopolization of energy production, with the sinking of the Titanic and the founding of the Federal Reserve Bank. At that time, the Cabal got rid of those industrialists who opposed the plan of establishing a new world order. The three most prominent opponents of the establishment of the Federal Reserve Bank, Benjamin Guggenheim, Isidore Strauss, and John Jacob Astor, all died with the sinking of the Titanic. The Titanic belonged to J.P. Morgan, one of the string pullers behind the creation of the Fed, who spontaneously decided against being present at the maiden voyage. In 1910, the first plans for the foundation of the Fed took place on Jekyll Island. In April 1912, the Titanic sank, 
In reality, her sister ship, the Olympic, sank. And a year later, in 1913, the Fed was founded with the passing of the Federal Reserve Act, thus laying the foundation for the arbitrary control of the world economy by the secret elite, which had already infiltrated most nations at that time. Woodrow Wilson signed the act, allowing the Fed to issue Federal Reserve notes, U.S. dollars. A few months later, the First World War began the civilizational decline in Central Europe. Nations were set against each other. In 1866, Otto von Bismarck led Prussia into the German War of Brothers against Austria. After the end of this fratricidal war, he did not include Austria in the newly formed North German Confederation and annexed Alsace-Lorraine. He thus created, possibly without being aware of it, the structural conditions for the First and Second World Wars. However, the assassination attempt on Bismarck and his dismissal by Wilhelm II indicate that he was a thorn in the side of the secret societies. His anti-Catholic policy of the Kulturkampf may also have contributed to this. The war against the Germans started with Rome's propaganda against the supposedly primitive Germania and continued with the Reformation Wars. Bismarck tried to reduce the influence of the Vatican and secret societies. The final nail in the coffin of Germany were the two world wars followed by controlled migration and population replacement. In the course of the Thirty Years' War, Germany's spiritual backbone was broken. As Heinrich Heine said, Bondage is in the German himself, in his soul. Worse than material slavery is spiritualized slavery. Germans must be liberated from within. Nothing helps from without. Albert Einstein published his two theories of relativity in 1905 and 1916. With the general theory of relativity, the ether was finally abolished in physics. General relativity was needed primarily to explain the properties of space without recourse to an objectively existing ether field. Even Einstein was so uncomfortable with this action in retrospect, presumably he realized at some point what his financiers had intended, that he later still tried to clarify that his theories would not work at all without the ether. But by then the damage was done, and he had fulfilled his role of eliminating the old knowledge of the holistic physics of the ether from science. Holistic scientists, like Nikola Tesla, had no place in the New World and were starved out, but only after their skills were used. Parents, beware! Your children, homeward bound from school, are being introduced to a new danger in the form of a drug cigarette, marijuana. It is convinced that he is hopelessly and incurably insane, a condition caused by the drug marijuana to which he was addicted. The monopolization of production also included the demonization of hemp. Andrew Mellon, Randolph Hearst, and the DuPont family were instrumental in pushing through the Mary Huana Tax Act of 1937, which raised taxes on hemp in the U.S. to bleed the hemp industry dry and support the oil industry. Banker Andrew Mellon appointed Harry Anslinger as chairman of the newly formed Federal Bureau of Narcotics. 
Basically, the goal was to create the conditions to make humanity dependent on the system in the long run and to eradicate any possibility of self-determination and freedom. The 19th century was also the time of the establishment of mass indoctrination institutions, called schools, where state-imposed propaganda was taught to educate young people to become willing recipients of orders. The expansion of compulsory education and the Gleichschaltung of teachers then picked up speed again in the 20th century with the rise of fascism and communism. If the Vatican had not already achieved sufficient success through the consistent persecution of witches and the Inquisition, as well as the burning of books and the destruction of culture, then its mission was crowned with success with the widespread introduction of religious propaganda which no child could escape. Thus, Karl Heinz Deschner wrote in his book God and the Fascists, the Vatican Alliance with Mussolini, Franco, Hitler, and Pavlovich, that under Mussolini, the books of the Italian elementary schools consisted of one-third catechism pieces and prayers and two-thirds of glorifications of fascism and war. The whole thing was crowned only by renewed bans on anti-clerical criticism and media coverage. Thus, one of the basic principles of the old world, each community, family, lives autonomously and is responsible for its own children, was invalidated. The consequent tearing apart of these communities and the early centralized indoctrination were of central importance. Then, with the Flexner Report of 1910, the robber barons Rockefeller and Carnegie destroyed holistic medicine in the U.S. and laid the groundwork for building the anti-life medical cartel under which we live today. Electrotherapy, phytotherapy, and osteopathy, for example, were banned from the official canon, and the curriculum was standardized so that pharma-controlled conventional medicine could establish itself as the only recognized form of medicine. Most independent schools were forced to close as a result of the Flexner Report. The Flexner Report was inspired by the destruction of alternative healing methods in Germany where the policies of the Flexner Report had already been implemented in 1880. Throughout his life, Flexner was an ardent advocate of the German pedagogical style of medical education. He firmly believed that medicine was a scientific discipline that could best be realized in America using the German model as a prototype. It was a system in which medical scientists were trained in university hospitals. Science as the animating force in the physician's life was the overarching theme, the zeitgeist in Flexner's conception of the ideal physician. Thomas P. Duffy, The Flexner Report, 100 Years Later. Every area of modern science is now dominated by an ideological doctrinaire establishment in which positions are awarded to each other and it is ensured that real insights are suppressed. Aan tafel is onder andere Connie Braan. Die schreef dit schitterende boek dat heet De Handelsreiziger. En dat gaat eigenlijk vooral over iets wat wij niet wisten, namelijk over de grootste cocaïnefabriek ter wereld. En die stond in Amsterdam aan de Weesbetrekvaart. The British used opium to take over China. In Europe, the Royal Dutch Cocaine Factory was responsible for anesthetizing the population and during World War I supplied all countries involved in the war with cocaine made from coca leaves imported from Peru. The origin of this factory was the Dutch East India Company. Next to the British East India Company, one of the most powerful trade and power structures of the colonial era. It was through the Dutch cocaine factory, which was supported and protected by the government and had a virtual monopoly on cocaine, that World War I was made possible, because it was only through alienation and anesthesia that soldiers were able to endure the suffering during the war. The Netherlands emerged from the First World War as one of the richest countries in the world thanks to the sale of cocaine. Innumerable traumatized soldiers remained addicted to cocaine after the war, and some even raided pharmacies to obtain it. For even more effective anesthetization of the World War II soldiers, 
The factory's production was shifted from cocaine to amphetamine in 1942. Michelle Gibson assumes that all the railroad tracks were just dug up and that all of the infrastructure, locomotives, cars, stations, was already in place as well. She speculates that it was an electrified rail system. And after the free worldwide energy grid was shut down, the free energy sources for mass transportation were replaced by oil and coal. The newly created dependence on fossil fuels was one of the foundations of the fabulous wealth of the industrialist robber baron families. About the tramway network in Manaus, Brazil, she writes. The historical narrative we are given says that rubber made Manaus the wealthiest city in South America in the late 1800s. And wealthy European families are said to have settled in Manaus, bringing their European art, architecture, and culture with them. It was a city at that time with electric trams and streetlights. Electric trams and streetlights? In the middle of the Amazon rainforest? No road connection to Manaus existed until 1973, with the completion of the BR-319, connecting Manaus to Porto Velo, Brazil. It is 540 miles long, or 870 kilometers, going through the rainforest and is impassable when it rains. It is known as Brazil's worst highway. There is no such tram system operating in Manaus today. The history we've been taught does not provide an adequate explanation for what was really going on here. This is a photo of undeveloped Amazon rainforest near Manaus. How are they supposed to have built all of this in the mid to late 1800s under these conditions? Michelle Gibson. Isn't it a bit strange that directly after the sinking of the Titanic and the crash of the Hindenburg, the way of transportation was standardized worldwide so that almost exclusively petroleum is used? And this has not changed in the last 100 years. Why was the public never shown a single photo showing the beginning of the Hindenburg's fire, although 22 professional photographers were present at the event? Why was the static spark theory chosen as the cause of the Hindenburg's sinking, even though there was no evidence to support this theory? Why did all nations stop building airships after the Hindenburg burned? Between 1907 and 1909, 16 imposing American warships with other escort ships, the so-called Great White Fleet, circumnavigated the world and paid a visit to many countries, as the story goes. Officially, the purpose was to demonstrate America's power to the world and to promote cooperation. But perhaps it was simply an inspection of the newly staked possessions around the world and an inventory of which kingdoms had not yet surrendered to the new order. The foundation of the world we live in today was laid at that time during the world's exhibitions. The technological knowledge of the old world was selected. One part of the knowledge was kept secret, the other part was presented to the public. One of the most important criteria in this decision-making process may have been whether a technology could be controlled by a central authority. Any form of free, no-cost energy, for example, was very dangerous to the forces that controlled the robber barons of the industrial age secretly from the shadows. It is important to understand that these industrialists had not earned their wealth themselves. They were born into elite families and chosen to play a role. These families and structures still exist today. Be it Elon Musk, Bill Gates, or Steve Jobs, none of them rose to power and money through their own efforts.
But to end with Tolkien, nothing is lost. In our world, Middle Earth, the descent into darkness dominated by evil is part of the process of humanity's evolution. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. From the ashes a fire shall be woken. A light from the shadows shall spring. Renewed shall be blade that was broken. The crownless again shall be king. I came into this world in the rough and ready year of 1923. It was a barbarous time. It was a bleak time and it was an uncivilized time. My memories stretch back almost a hundred years. And if I close my eyes, I can smell the poverty that oozes from the dusky tenement streets of my boyhood. I can taste on my lips the bread and drippings that I was served for my tea. I can remember extreme hunger and my parents undying lot for me. Tried to keep our family safe and healthy in the slum 